With that being said, let's get our service started. We're going to Psalm 47 this morning. Psalm 47. As we get started, I love to get to pray the Psalms over our service. And this one is one of my favorite Psalms. And so I invite you into it with me. Psalm 47. It says this, clap your hands, all you peoples. Shout to God with a jubilant cry. For the Lord, the most high, is awe-inspiring. A great king over the whole earth. He subdues people under us and nations under our feet. He chooses for us our inheritance, the pride of Jacob whom he loves. God ascends among shouts of joy. The Lord with the sound of trumpets. Sing praise to God, sing praise, sing praise to our king, sing praise, sing a song of wisdom, for God is king of the whole earth. God reigns over the nations. God is seated on his holy throne. The nobles of the people have assembled with the people of the God of Abraham, for the leaders of the earth belong to God. He is greatly exalted. Pray with me. God, I thank you for this reminder today. As Brian expressed, God, you are sovereign. You are in control. God, and when we lean into the fact that you are the king of the whole universe and every nation and every president, every mayor, every governor, every leader, God, all of them submit to you. You are head over the whole world and you are also head of the church. God, help to remind us that it is you who we are to keep our eyes fixed on. Not the things going on around us, not the circumstances of the world, not what the government says, not what celebrities say, God, but what you say. For you are the king. And give us clarity. Give us a pure heart. Give us open eyes. Give us open ears to embrace the message you have for us today through your son as he preaches to us what it means to be blessed. I pray this in your name, the name of the holy God of the universe, the King of kings, Lord of lords, Jesus, God Almighty. Amen. I want to remind you of an amazing passage. Come with me to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. It's one of my favorite passages in 1 John because I think it just expresses the heart of Jesus as really, you know, if you've read John's gospel, you'll, you'll see this really in the end of his gospel as, as Jesus is praying before he goes to the cross. But there's this reality that as Christians, right, even though we're living in the world, We're not to be of the world. And all that simply means is is you're here temporarily, right? Your residence is in heaven. The kingdom you are a part of is Jesus's kingdom, right? And as a result, your time here is supposed to be spent differently. It's supposed to be spent in light of that kingdom that is to come. And so you look at the things around you and you realize, hey, these things, they're not gonna last. They're not gonna last. And that's exactly what John emphasizes here. And I want to read it. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, it says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride in one's possessions is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world with its lust, it's passing away. But the one who does the will of God remains forever. You see, there's this focus. It's about God, right? God is eternal and he's inviting us into his eternal kingdom. This stuff around us is temporary. No matter what it is, good or bad, in this world, these things are temporary. And so we should not be focusing in, participating in and making ourselves of the world because it won't last. But God lasts forever. And so when we obey him and we seek his kingdom, we seek something that is eternal, something that is uh, just immensely more beneficial and positive in our lives than the things in the world. Today, Jesus is gonna lay out some beatitudes. 
And over the last few weeks, I've been emphasizing the fact that when, when Jesus teaches, it seems to go entirely contrary to what the world teaches. Right? We're going to read these passages today, and I think it really strikes that part of things. The, the reality that Jesus is looking to an eternal kingdom, the kingdom of his Father that he's going to establish, and he's looking at what it means to live in light of that kingdom today, and what it means to be blessed by God. And when you read them, they, they just don't make any sense when you're just thinking from a worldly perspective. I want to invite us today to take very seriously this teaching from Jesus. I think this is so important. You got to hear me if you're listening this morning. Before we come back as a church together, this teaching from Jesus needs to be on our hearts. It needs to be on our minds. It needs to be a focus and an emphasis that we say, I'm going to prioritize what Jesus has taught here over the way that the world is acting and the way that the world wants me to act. It's so important. So let's get into it. Matthew chapter 5. We are in verse 7 together. It says this, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. I just want to look at this. Three simple passages. But look at how contrary these three simple passages are to the world. Let's look at the first one. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Just to put it simply, in the world, that is just untrue. That is just untrue in the world. I've noticed, and I'm sure you've noticed this too, showing mercy in our current culture is almost inexcusable. It's almost inexcusable. You know, think of the mob mentality we see on social media, how so quickly a storm can form. One misstep, one mistake, one thing in your past that you're not proud of comes out, and all of a sudden, uh, people are, are trying to bury you as much as they can. I think of this idea of cancel culture, right, that we hear going around. But it's, there is a reality to this. Being merciful is unacceptable, right? If you see somebody make a mistake, you got to jump on it. You got to attack them, especially if they're an, a political oppo- opponent or they have a different worldview than you do or, or whatever it may be. If we just see one thing, I'm going after you. I'm getting a, a little bit of revenge. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to punish you for your mistakes, It's so interesting to me. In the world, being merciful is viewed as a weakness. It's viewed as a weakness. If I see you make a mistake and I don't call you out, or if I don't join in with the cancel culture, with the mob, then I'm I'm allowing them to to spread their viewpoint, or I'm allowing them to to do these things. And that's inexcusable. How dare you do that? Don't show them mercy or compassion. But in the kingdom, isn't mercy one of the most beautiful truths? In the gospel, isn't mercy one of the most beautiful truths? That God, instead of looking at us and punishing us for our sins the way we deserve, he decided to show mercy in the cross? Isn't that one of the most fundamental truths of the Christian faith? And yet I see over and over again so many Christians tempted to be unmerciful, to be vengeful, to be angry, to do everything they can to step on people when they make mistakes and put them down. Or even people who are are living in sin, right? Who are broken and and just their lives, uh, they just show just contempt for God and contempt for you. There's a temptation to, to say, well, now I can jump in. Now I can attack them. Now I can go after them. No. Did not God love us and show us mercy while we were his enemy? while we were still living in sin. So we are to be merciful. What about the second one? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. For they will see God. Does that fit the world today to be pure in heart? Well, I don't think so. I think for the most part in the world, to be pure in heart is just to have whatever feelings you have, right? There's not an objective standard of what it means to be pure in heart. Instead, purity of heart is just whatever your heart happens to feel is pure. Whatever you feel like you want to do, do. Whatever you want, whatever you love, whatever you desire, go after it. Whatever makes you happy. 
That's what it means to be pure in heart, to be true to yourself. Even if that goes against what God says and what God wants. In the kingdom, being pure in heart allows us to be in a relationship with God. Do you see that? We can see God. Well, this last one, blessed are the peacemakers. <laughs> I have to laugh at this one when we think about the world and the way the world is. I just think of the fact that, you know, just think about the political side of things. How hard is it for someone to be a peacemaker in the political world, to cross the aisle and to work with other people? Not in today's culture, not in today's world. Being a peacemaker, again, is viewed as a weakness. Wanting to bring people together who have differing, differing views and differing backgrounds and wanting healing and reconciliation, that thing is viewed as a weakness in the world. But in the kingdom of God, it is the peacemakers who are called God's children. I love these passages from Jesus. I want to take a deeper look. We, we see how the culture and the world is opposed to this teaching, but I want to take a deeper look at why this teaching is the better way. Why you are really blessed when you are merciful, when you're pure in heart, and when you're a peacemaker. So let's take a look in Scripture. So our first beatitude, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. I think the immediate question is, what does it look like? What does it even mean to show mercy? If you go to Luke chapter 6, go to Luke chapter 6 verse 32. In Luke chapter 6, verse 32, and really in, in the previous section, Luke is accounting a different time when Jesus was preaching the Beatitudes, these blessings. And, and we talked about these a few weeks ago as well. And, and so Luke is moving in, and, and right after this teaching about blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy, in Luke's accounting, Jesus gives this additional teaching. So in Luke chapter 6, verse 32, we see this. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return and your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. 36, be merciful even as your father is merciful. So to give a simple definition of mercy, it's showing compassion and love to someone who doesn't deserve it. Showing compassion and love to someone who doesn't deserve it. You see, Jesus is talking about your enemies. The people who, who attack you, who hate you. He invites you to be like the Father who is merciful, even on, it says, the ungrateful and the evil. To be merciful, to show compassion and love to someone who doesn't deserve it. So why do this? Why show mercy? Why live this way where you're constantly showing compassion to people who are hurting you even, who are attacking you? Why do that? Because to show, show compassion is to be like God. You see that if we are merciful, God promises to be merciful to us. And don't you want God to be merciful to you? Don't you want God to be merciful to you? Continuing in Luke chapter 6, verse 37, she just continues this teaching by saying, Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, we put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. I want to get something a little bit different today because we're doing three Beatitudes. I'm going to do our lessons for disciples along the way instead of just at the end. So here's our first lesson for disciples today. Showing mercy does not show weakness. Instead, it shows the love of Christ. It shows the love of Christ. Here's the thing, folks. And I think Bob, who's one of our elders in, in our conversation this week about the sermon, really pointed out something I think is really important. How hard is it to be merciful 
to people that have hurt you. And, and Bob applied it specifically to our family life, right? That just gets right down to the, to the meat of it. You see, because your family are the ones that you're around all the time, right? It might be a little easier to be merciful to somebody who, who's a stranger, right? They do something that, that they cut you off in traffic or, or what have you. It's easier to be merciful to them. You're never going to really see them or interact with them. Even your friends in some occasions, it can be easier to be merciful with them because you don't walk with them day to day, but your family, you see all the time. You're always in that relationship. How hard can it be when your family hurts you to show mercy and to be compassionate and loving? It's really hard. And the church is this picture of like a family, right? Brothers and sisters coming together as one family were to live together and eat together and be together. So in the same way, it can be difficult to show mercy when someone at church wrongs you and hurts you. And I'm not saying, you got to hear me in this, I'm not saying that somebody who's just constantly coming after you, hurting you, hurting you, hurting you, and they're not repentant at all, they have no remorse at all about the situation, that you just got to let them run you over. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is when someone's truly apologetic, or even if they're not, but you're in a situation that you need to offer that mercy to them, as God is merciful to you. And the biggest piece of it is this. Jesus says it, the measure you use will be measured back to you. The measure you use will be measured back to you. To put it simply, think about how you want God to look at you and then look at others in that way. For me, my policy is I'm going to show as much grace and mercy and compassion is humanly possible because I know how much mercy I need from God. I know how much mercy I need from God. And that can be hard, but it is so important. Let's look at the next lesson for this, or sorry, the next teaching of Jesus in these Beatitudes. Verse eight, blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. You know, one of the most powerful things in the Bible about seeing God is that it's kind of dangerous. It's kind of dangerous. I go back to the story in Exodus chapter 33. You don't have to go there. But in the story, Jesus, or sorry, not Jesus, Moses is saying to God, hey, I want to see you. I want to see your glory. And I want you to see this interaction between Moses and God in Exodus 33. In verse 19, it says, and he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you. And will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I'll be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face for man shall not see me and live. Do you see how the beatitude of the previous one is connected, right? God's gonna show mercy on whom he shows mercy. And in order to see God, you have to receive mercy from God. But I love this picture. Moses wants to see God, but God says, hey, Listen, there, there, there's a divide here. You know, the purity level, the holiness level that I'm on, the glory that I have, you can't see because if you see it, you'll die. So he passes Moses by in this, in this story so that he, does, he can see him without dying. But Jesus' promise in the beatitude is if you're pure in heart, you're gonna see God someday. You're gonna see God someday. You see how I understand this. We've been redeemed. We have the Holy Spirit living in us, changing us, making us new, giving us a new heart, purifying us, making us clean. And someday we're gonna be so pure that we're gonna see God face to face. That's an amazing truth. Check this out in 1 John. Going back to this is where I started in verse three. Or sorry, in chapter three, verse one, it says this. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us, that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. 
Hear this last piece. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. So here's our second lesson for disciple today. Purity does not show weakness. Instead, it shows true faith. Instead, it shows true faith. You know, in the Bible, there's a connection between purity of heart and what you see in the world. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus teaches this. In verse 22, it'll be up on your screen. It says this, The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? And that seems kind of silly, right? How do you have a healthy or a bad eye? What does that really mean? You know, we have a few people in our congregation, a few of our elders who have some bad eyes, right? And you might say, well, (laughs) they got this this bad eye, so there's darkness. You know, that's not what Jesus is talking about. He's not talking about a, a physical ailment. There's something deeper here, right? And we all know this. The way we view the world is not through our eyes, but through our heart. The way we view the world is not through our eyes, but through our heart. When I go out into the world, you and I have totally different experiences. And we view the world totally different. But our eyes are seeing the same thing, right? Our eyes are seeing the same thing around us. But when we see those things, we view them completely differently because our hearts are different. You do not see with your eyes, you see with your heart. So how do we connect this to Jesus' teaching on the pure in heart? We'll see God. It's very simple. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. I love this passage. I love this passage. And there's so much here I could go into, but for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into a ton. I'm just actually going to go straight into our lesson for disciple here in this one. So, so blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Here's our third lesson for disciple today. Peacemaking does not show weakness Instead, it shows a true relationship with God. Peacemaking does not show weakness. Instead, it shows a true relationship with God. I have to stop here for a minute. And I'm actually really glad that Kenyon switched out my batteries here because I'm sure that you guys missed a whole section of my last point. But this point is really the end-all, be-all of the whole sermon today. So, So just listen in right here. Peacemaking does not show weakness. Instead, it shows a true relationship with God. Hear this passage in Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6, starting in verse 16. It says this, The Lord hates six things. In fact, seven are detestable to him. Arrogant eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that plots wicked schemes, feet eager to run to evil, a lying witness who gives false testimony. And this is the seventh, and one who stirs up trouble among brothers. Do you notice how this proverb is emphasizing that last one, right? In verse 16, the Lord hates six things. In fact, seven are detestable to him. And what's the seventh one that he emphasizes? He can't leave out, right? He thought of six. Oh wait, there's actually a seventh one. I can't leave this one out. What's that one? 
the one who stirs up trouble among brothers. You see, the Lord hates divisiveness, especially in the church. The Lord hates divisiveness, especially in the church. Check out Titus chapter 3 in verse 10. It says this, reject a divisive person after a first and second warning. For you know that such a person has gone astray and is sinning. He is self-condemned. He is self-condemned. Being a peacemaker is not optional. It's what it means to be a son and daughter of God. Because God, through his son, through the cross, has made peace with us by showing us mercy, by teaching us purity and true faith. And that is our invitation as Christians to be peacemakers. I gotta stop for a second. And I gotta ask, do we in the church, surprise Christian church, do we have a priority of being peacemakers? And this is why I said at the beginning, it's so important today that we hear this before we go into the building. Before we go into the building. Because here is the thing that we are all going to be tempted to partake in. And that's divisiveness. You see, in our world right now, every issue is a divisive issue. Every issue. If you aren't on my side, you need to be crushed. You need to be stopped. You need to be stomped out. You need to be insulted and attacked and embarrassed and shamed, right? It's not this mentality of I want peace between brothers and sisters. It's this mentality of if you don't agree with me, you're against me (laughs) and I'm coming after you. And I just have to be frank, if we all come back here with a divisive heart, we'll tear each other apart. And that's the reason that the Lord hates divisiveness. And so I want to invite you into this just now, before we even get together again, just now in your life, really sit down in prayer and ask the Lord, Lord, have I been divisive in my life? Have I been somebody who, even over the smallest issue, is starting a fight with people? Because it really matters. It really matters. Now, I'm not saying that division all across the board is bad. Of course not, right? Of course not. The Lord invites us to, to be, just in, just in what we're talking about right here, separate from the world. Do not be of the world. That's a division there, right? We're supposed to put up a wall. I'm not going to participate in worldly activity. I'm not going to be of the world. That's a division there. So not all division is bad. But divisiveness just because. Just because you want people to argue and fight and to hurt others, that is what the Lord hates. We have a real challenge, friends, to not be divisive with one another. When we come back, there will be some in our church not wearing masks. There will be some in our church wearing masks. If you make that a divisive issue, that's a problem for me. That's a problem for me. And I can, I can say with clarity, with the elders behind me, that when we see people getting divided and getting at each other's throats over something that silly, there will be warnings as encouraged in Titus. Stop being a divisive person because the Lord hates that activity on either side, whether you're getting mad at people for not wearing a mask or whether you're getting mad at people for wearing one. We won't tolerate that type of divisiveness in the house of God over nothing, a nothing issue. Right? We all have to have that in our hearts and our minds when we come together. We are not going to be a divisive people. We're not going to fight over the small issues. We're going to focus on Jesus. We're going to want unity. We're going to want peacemaking. We're going to want to show each other mercy and compassion and love. We're going to want to come with a pure heart and a pure mind seeking the Lord because that's what it means to be blessed. 
And we're going to have real challenges with one another. And I want to say, be compassionate. Have in your mind, whatever I hold people to, God's going to hold me to that. So if I can't live up to my own standards, I shouldn't be holding those on other people. And have a mentality of love and wanting to speak grace and truth to the people around you. To bring people together in Christ instead of tearing them apart. We have enough in the world to divide us. Let us not invite that division into the church. Let us be divided over the things that matter. Who Jesus is, who God is, what the gospel is, what our lives should be in light of Jesus' sacrifice for us. Those are the things we can argue and fight over in tooth and nail if we have to, because those are the things that are eternal. But the things of the world, we need to be one mind, one heart, focused on Jesus, seeking the benefit of those around us and loving them the way Jesus loves us. Pray with me. God, you are an awesome God. Help us in this season as a church as we move into coming back together and being together again. God, let us have pure hearts. I know that in this season, you've been teaching us so many things. You've been teaching us so many things, Lord. And I know you have so much more to teach us, so much more to invite us into, to grow in. And every delay, every moment where we have to be more and more patient, God, as as your timing is perfect on when we come back together, God, every moment that we do that, let us look for that lesson that you're teaching us in that moment. So that when we all come back together in here, It is with a pure heart, focused on Christ, faith and hope in him, purifying ourselves as he is pure by hoping in him. God, let us be with a mentality of mercy so that we may receive mercy. And let it be with a mentality of peacemaking, wanting the people around us to be one mind and one heart in you, Lord Jesus. We thank you for all that you've done, your sacrifice on the cross. And I pray this in your holy name, the name of Jesus, amen.